uh, I'm happy to introduce um, Jan Hedler of Realities uh, United to you tonight. Um, Realities United is a company founded by Jan and Tim, two brothers from Berlin. They are both architects by training and the company um, deals with issues of combining art, um, um, uh, media and space, so let's say architecture. Um, you will see more of their work uh, probably in the next 150 slides. Um, before Jan and Tim uh, founded uh, Realities United in 2000, um, they initiated um, Kunst und Technik, Verein Kunst und Technik, which was a, pla or which, yeah, which was a platform for, um, uh, for people from all di different disciplines to get together to develop projects and exchange ideas. Part of that, um, of that platform was uh, an informal meeting place, uh, let's say a bar, and uh, where people could meet, make their own music, etc., and discuss, and this thing became so successful uh, after the New York Times wrote uh, or voted it for the coolest place in Berlin to be, the most trendy place, that um, you know, it attracted, uh, it attracted uh, hundreds of people um, every week, so they had to change uh, their opening times to a kind of more, um, what is it, more chiffre, more um, secret uh, code, so that not so many people would find it, actually. Um, which is quite curious, and if you are dealing uh, with, um, uh, let's say, uh, if you are on the forefront of a global debate around a multidisciplinary field of combining architecture, art uh, and media, and if you're leading the discussion with which uh, Jan and Tim are doing, you have to, um, and for the sake of argument also, if you're running a very popular place in Berlin, uh, which attracts so many people, uh, it's not so easy, you know, Berlin is not Vienna and it's certainly not some kind of small uh, village. I would say it's the most uh, the exciting capital here in Europe. Um, so if you're on the forefront of all these discussions, what you need to have is, um, let's say, of course, um, determination and vigor, but also um, you have to reassess and or you have to reassess and reevaluate your, your ideas in this changing current of um, to say this global discussion, this very dynamic global discussion. So this vigor and determination and let's say the, the, the constant reassessment, that's what they're doing, that's what they have, and that's what makes them so special in this field uh, and so successful for the last uh, nine years. Um, also, personally, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Jan to you tonight because uh, I know for ages, because we've been sitting next to each other in high school, and before we both even thought of uh, you know, studying architecture or something stupid, we were copying each other's uh, homework or uh, you know, doing, doing stuff that... No, you copied mine. <laughs> but at least, you know, he, he became famous and, and, and your humble assistant. So, um, yeah, please welcome Jan. Thanks for coming. Sitting on the desk using the mouse and so on, but that 
interaction with machine might be a very physical and um, sportive thing. So rather Kung Fu soft than uh, Microsoft, it's not healthy. Um, so um, Niels already mentioned our projects are somehow gathered around art, architecture and communication and um, you might have read that on the invitation card. I call that lecture contemporary architecture. Uh, which you might find a bit uh, provocative because we haven't done a single building in our whole life. And um, so why would we be people talking about contemporary architecture? Um, maybe there's two things. First of all, because a very simple thing, there's a project that is called Contemporary Architecture. I'm going to so show that uh, later on. Uh, but more importantly, um, because if you consider architecture to be the production of reality today, um, we think it's necessary in order to do that very efficiently and effectively to consider all available means for the production of reality. So it's not limited to the uh, classic uh, means which you would determine to be architectural. So there's a lot of things happening um, surrounding us and um, they are all influencing um, our perception of how cities are functioning. Uh, a lot of things which have become obvious over the last year like online shopping, virtual worlds, the combination of the two, they all change actually how we must perceive, for instance, a marketplace. A marketplace a long time ago was something completely different than today. Today it's mostly electronic, things like that. And um, talking about things like that, it's also important to not get trapped in um, visions or images of things where you kind of seem to know how it must look like. Um, if you look at the early visions of how um, a computer-human interaction might look like, um, hell from 2001, looking at reality uh, at the same time, which was much different, and what did it, what did it come out of it? You know, it's, it's a complete different thing. Nobody um, really expected that. So, working on the edge of, of uh, incorporating all kinds of weapons, you could say, uh, so the choice of weapons is free. Um, just going to show that project very uh, quickly. It's a project we developed for Vita Design Museum. It was an um, invited thing with 12 architects from all over the world uh, trying to develop a vision of how living in the future might look like. Um, it's called Open the House the Exhibition. It's still touring throughout the world. And um, we got interested in what did modern architecture promise, you know, what this um, very transparent, very um, outside thing uh, being connected to the outside world. And then reflecting it back to our reality where we are, uh, being in a high-rise building in Berlin, for instance, uh, feeling like in a fish tank. So, um, the reality of being connected to the outside and actually being isolated um, is something which is quite a strong moment, at least if you're not living in a very mild climate. So, we were kind of thinking about the possibilities to bring back that contact to, to nature and thought about um, the brief concept of um, rather heating the body than um, heating the space analyzing how much energy you use and so on and so in a way this is a very it's not architecture it's more like a strategy to determine um, you're wearing intelligent underwear which is um, uh, figuring out um, what your current energy consumption is and uh, how much energy you would need to feel comfortable determining the outside um, temperature so um, that obviously um, if you do that, so that's prototypes we made, um, the technology for things like that is more or less there. It's an evolution process which probably will continue over the next couple of years, but uh, we also, uh, already have those intelligent uh, fibers and we do have um, uh, batteries that could do that and so on. So um, that's how it looks like as a prototype. Uh, that's uh, how you store uh, the uh, batteries in the female version. And the six pack for the male version then. <laughs> and what does it mean for architecture? Basically it means that um, architecture could some, is somehow um, open up. So the project itself inside the exhibition Open House is called Open the House. Uh, not, not so much of saying 
architecture is disappearing, but rather saying that architecture could suddenly become uh, converted into different zones. And um, obviously that would save a lot of energy, uh, because you would only heat certain zones in the house where you would um, need to feel comfortable naked, for instance, like bathrooms and, and so on, but for instance the kitchen could be nearly outside. Little models being made, very cute. So that's like a, just a, a brief thing, so uh, what is it? It's an, it's an expanded um, understanding of architecture. It's dynamization of architecture, dynamic architecture has always been on the minds of um, you know, architects. Um, exciting area uh, to work on and uh, there's a lot of visions out there how they're being reflected in reality today and um, we kind of got into that um, field of uh, doing dynamic things as well uh, I'm going to show that movie here also just briefly to, to give you a little bit of a background of um, our very early days uh, this is a project called Einhaus which means as much as in and out and it's a mobile space extension so um, You know what it is, I mean, it's, it's a possibility to sit outside for a, for a place that doesn't have a balcony and um, it's, uh, it's a possibility to ex expand space, expand the, the personal space but that's not what the project really is about, it's more about the idea of um, walking on the legal line of architecture so the, the real concept behind this project was less saying I want to have that space outside, obviously that was as well there, but it was more like how could you do it in a pragmatic way and how could you do it without uh, ending up having this endless procedure talking to landlords and so on. So it's a project which is um, obviously not touching the facade but is um, solely installed on the inside um, of the flat and um, it can only be operated on a uh, open window, so it's uh, definitely a temporary installation and uh, it's operable at uh, most window sizes, so it's quite flexible and the vision behind it was a mass uh, product that you could buy in the supermarket we never got it there, it got to the Vita design chair exhibition somehow for a period of time, but it never made it to the product and um, I'm not so much showing that in order to show what we have done those crazy exciting things in the past but it's more like um, looking at this notion of dy dynamic things happening in architecture because back at the time um, for us this project was about a piece of furniture and maybe it was cross-roaded with a piece of yeah, sporting device somehow and later on we somehow found out that the project is much more about communication, I guess, because obviously uh, a person who would buy uh, or use uh, a chair like that is a quite outgoing person. It's more to check up your neighbor than anything else. And it also scares the shit out of <laughs> So those um, early experiments. <coughs> Yeah, so um, how, how uh, did I come here? Uh, I would say I, I did come here because um, Niels, who I, you have heard that, I met him at high school and we were friends. He called me a long time after we uh, didn't really see each other anymore, I guess. And that was a time when they had won the, um, the competition for the Kunsthaus. You all know that building. Uh, I'm not going to um, talk too much about it because most of you will know it anyhow. Uh, maybe the interesting bit about this project is we got into this uh, whole thing because um, there was supposed to be a commission called the Conception for the Integration of Media Technology. Um, and nobody knew what that was supposed to be. I think it was more connected to the idea of we are doing a quite contemporary modern building and somehow if you do that today it's it will be connected to the idea of using media technology and so on and someone has to think about it and uh, so as nobody knew what this was supposed to be we developed this whole broad catalogue of ideas 
And one of the ideas um, we developed, a lot of them are very pragmatic, uh, and one of the ideas we uh, developed was looking at um, the difference of the original competition uh, design and the construction reality at that time. Because the architects got under quite a bit of uh, pressure, uh, both for financial and technical reasons, to um, uh, lose more and more of the original uh, intended transparency of the others, or the hull, or the skin of the goose house. And so we were thinking about uh, possible ways of bringing back that transparency even in an immediate way. And did that proposal of um, integrating circular fluorescent light tubes into the eastern facade and using them as a very low resolution uh, grayscale dis display. Um, the project became reality, even though um, we, when we proposed it, I think it was definitely the idea and the whole catalog of ideas where we believed it's never going to happen because there was no brief, there was, we were not commissioned to do so, and there was no budget, and the, the project was, the, 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 the project budget was closed. So there was no big chance of really uh, seeing this become reality, and I think in the end it became reality through a series of processes, but especially because um, the whole argument of doing a transparent skin uh, on the building uh, to um, give it also some political um, backdrop. So I think it was more like a political argument in the end. Oh, we, we have to do the transparent uh, skin, which has a lot of risk in it, uh, uh, because if we don't do it, the facade is not going to work. And uh, suddenly all Everybody seemed to know uh, that the facade must be there. Um, so, what, what was the design project? Just very quickly, obviously, it was about um, the integration, the complex scale, and it was about budget because there was no budget, and we were looking at technologies which would be suitable to um, to affect the scale of the building rather than um, attaching anything to it. And uh, the red rectangle, which you can see here marks the area which we could have treated using LED high-end technology at that time. So we kind of traded the idea of television um, against a very low resolution, very kind of spiky format, uh, very special format, no color, just grayscales. Uh, but it merged quite beautiful um, into the, uh, the skin design and blurred the boundaries of the skin where it has this kind of treatment and where it doesn't uh, very expressive format because it's an artistic institution and deliberately um, using old technology, old technology because we were worried about the Kunsthaus not having a budget to uh, constantly updating uh, over the years and media technology tends to grow old very very quickly still today and so we thought it might be good to use something which is old already so you don't have to worry about it. Um, it's very low resolution, so that's 930 pixels, which you can see here. Um, uh, that made it clear, as it's also a very uh, spiky format, as I said, it's difficult for an artist to imagine how will a production um, to be shown on that skin um, look like later on in the urban context on that doubly curved surface and so on. And so um, we also got involved into software development like a 3D real-time visualization um, tool which allows you to test your personal um, productions at home rather than testing them in the urban um, environment. Uh, let me think if I... No, I'm not going to show you. Um, so th that kind of was a starting point thinking about what everybody calls media facades and um, uh, working on this very special format. And we were very happy about that because um, also it was a hint towards a discussion about uh, what does a building do when suddenly it does have the possibility to talk to, um, to the outside. So because we have no real culture in the understanding of um, how a building behaves, behaves if it's, uh, it becomes dynamic. And so we can afford Having this very special and spiky format, it will um, force you to develop special content for it. And so the, the Kunsthaus project was obviously a platform idea, um, allowing 
<coughs> allowing the Kunsthaus to um, invite artists to, to produce pieces for it and uh, do the communication for the Kunsthaus to the exterior. Coming from there, the, pro the, the project being published a lot and so on, we got pigeonholed. So um, today um, we are the media facade guys and um, we got off uh, sorts of um, the people contacting us to basically do a copy of that project. And uh, one of those projects uh, we did, uh, which evolved about one and a half years later, was a temporary installation at Potsdamer Platz. Um, this was a 100% copy commission. So they said, why can't you do exactly what you have done in Graz using circular fluorescent light tubes and so on, covering the building of this high rise building at Potsdamer Platz um, in Berlin? Because uh, it's empty and we want the building to be published a lot. Uh, this side of Potsdamer Platz is being published, that side isn't. And uh, so uh, it was very short notice uh, commission um, having about half a year to do the concept development, planning, production and so on. And so we kind of got interested in um, continue working on this idea of what is a pixel in architecture, putting started that, um, uh, that discussion in Graz and as there was no uh, real time the project to develop new technologies for instance we worked on the idea of uh, shifting grids in this project um, using different pixel formats uh, construction was quite a heavy challenge because we were literally not allowed to drill a single hole in this whole facade so it's a double layer facade which is existing and we had to squeeze everything in without changing the building a bit it was a contractual um, issue so you see the, the lights being installed in between that existing facade. The building is empty, as I said. We tried to persuade the, the client to um, uh, spend a bit more money and do, it, um, a do a transparent version of it in order to uh, keep it and do it a permanent piece, but uh, they didn't want to. Working on different densities and ideas of how to distribute uh, the lights on the facade getting into color because obviously the facade was transparent and not translucent. Color being an issue that you would suddenly see the daytime, so it must be daytime sign, uh, getting, having shifted the pixels by 30 degrees, uh, getting interested in tessellation patterns, uh, looking at MC Escher and so on, and so the, the whole idea of this layering in the facade evolved. And, um, uh, Again, this, this was, a, um, it was up for 18 months, it was also a platform idea, so there was three curated sets of exhibitions from different curators with different artists and vital ones from uh, all over the place, some famous ones, some uh, non-famous ones, and each piece being shown on the facade for a month. So it was quite important to also develop an idea of the format of how something like this would be used in the urban environment. because. Right away after they commissioned us to do it, they said, oh great, uh, we're doing this facade and uh, <coughs> we thought we could earn some money at the same time and use it for advertising. And we said, no, you can't because your commission was to make the, famous, uh, the, the building famous. If you use it for advertising, nobody's going to publish it. So you need to stay to some sort of artistic idea behind it. So this whole uh, discussion arose out of it and we developed this format for them because they said they wouldn't have the budget to commission the artists anymore. Um, we said, well then, do it like a museum. Do six days art from Tuesday to Sunday and Monday is commercials. Uh, so that was the agreement, we did that, but they never found a company who really wanted to produce any commercials for it because the format was um, so heavy to, you have to produce specific content for it, otherwise it doesn't work. So just that you get, you get an idea, um, how it looked. So you see that the lights can be controlled quite quickly. Um, the Kunsthaus here in Berlin, it was 18 images per second. Um, but uh, today you can do it quicker, it's more like a budget decision, so uh, you can get more high-end quality if you like. But in a way it's also not, not the issue. Um, 
so the, the color um, the coating of the softbox is a slight diffuser because it's important to um, to get this effect that the, the individual pixels will connect to each other. If you turn on the light on the inside of the building or to see, you can actually um, make it quite transparent. So this is a non-transparent version, so if you would do the whole construction more transparent, obviously also do this criminal piece. And actually there was one floor that the second top level of the building which was used by the bank themselves and so we did special lights in front of their windows and they had movement sensors inside the offices. So if they were working, um, the, the lights were uh, turned off in front of the windows automatically, so they wouldn't be disturbed, and they obviously could look um, outside. I think that's enough to put it in the question mark, it's right. Um, as I said, a lot of experiments followed, uh, having all this um, people contacting us and but also getting into this idea of um, how, how does this pixel research work. We worked with Christian Müller on an installation for San Jose Airport, uh, working on different ideas of um, using pixel elements and understanding what it means to the readability of images, getting more spatial, a very, very short notice, quick project with uh, Min Sung Cho of Mad Studies in Seoul in Korea last year, I think it was last year. Um, uh, for a festival, um, horrible scenario to work in, to be honest. Uh, no control at all. Um, a project in Singapore we are uh, currently finishing, it's nearly completed um, together with Buha Architects, uh, a quite successful a young office from Singapore, very big, I think there are nearly 100 people today. And uh, they got us into this project called an urban entertainment center in Singapore, uh, again with the vision of having a building which was non transparent in a certain part because it was containing shopping, uh, cinemas, uh, theater space, and so on. And saying um, the, the district of the city here asks for things to become more quirky because Singapore is kind of worried about being too boring. And so they want to establish a new nightlife district, and so lighting schemes and media ideas like that are welcome and uh, also being supported financially by the government. And so they uh, gave us a building which, for ha having no windows, being covered with glass, featuring a space in between to put our lights in between. And um, that was a point when we said, well, is it really so smart to do this really kind of stupid double layer facade setting here? Why wouldn't you want to give us a budget of the glass facade and we rather try to develop a facade system? So that's what, what um, happened. Um, a facade made out of three um, polycarbonate pieces, um, vacuum formed, uh, which basically make a, um, a screen facade in front of the non transparent facade of the building. Some of them have intelligence or light elements in it, but it's more like a, a transition between daytime design and nighttime design. Obviously it's not being invisible anymore. So you see the, the distribution, it's like, uh, you'll see the, the building in a, in a second, but it's like an undulating facade with ribbons. And so uh, the pixels, or the, the pills, how we call them, are distributed in different densities and different configurations, having intelligent elements and non-intelligent elements. One to ten scale model making, uh, one to one scale prototyping in our office, one to one scale prototyping in Singapore, installation process. As you can see here, um, you have seen those uh, aluminum reflectors on the inside. Obviously, they're designed to work for the lights themselves, for the pills that have lights, uh, but obviously also in the areas where you do not have any lights to reflect the sun. Um, that's how it looks. Being lit at night uh, looks colorful, it isn't though. Uh, I still like it. Um, it's, a, it's a trick. Uh, if you take an image with a wrong exposure, it will pick up. If your uh, shutter speed is too fast, it will uh, pick up the, um, the dimming curve of the fluorescent, and you can see the colors the human eye would not see. It's quite beautiful. That's how it looks like. That's a building. The building is difficult, I have to admit. And um, uh, 
let me show um, just some really moving images of that as well. Uh, again, this is a platform project. I'm going to come back to the issue of content. I, I just have addressed it very briefly, as you have noticed. This is the most powerful facade we've done. Actually, uh, those images were all taken in March, and we were quite overwhelmed by seeing how powerful it is. So you somehow need a driver's license to, to use it, otherwise it's quite obnoxious. Because it's, uh, it's 6,000 pixels, in this case, using compact fluorescent light, so it gets very, very bright. So in a way, it's beautiful because it allows you to do things like that. So very distinct drawings on that building, um, setting highlights on the building, but it's not meant to be that bright. It's, it's rather a subtle thing. So all the things you can see here, content-wise, are just testing. This was all during the commissioning of the software, uh, which we have done for that. If I have time, I can show the software maybe um, later on for a second. You get the idea how it looks. Quite beautiful and heavy mountain rain with cats in the street. So becoming more uh, three-dimensional, as you notice, and more visible at daytime. Um, this is also valid uh, for this project. We have developed together with Nito Subatan, the Spanish office. Um, they won the competition for the um, Media Arts Center in Cordoba in Spain. Uh, this is the competition entry model, first prize, and uh, you see a top view of the building and um, understand that the organization of the inner space uh, uh, by the architects, by Nito Subatan, who were not involved in that, uh, is um, gathered around this idea of different um, hexagonal patterns then being transformed and reformed. Uh, the location is here. And uh, that's also a competition model and what you can see is um, that the architects picked up uh, uh, more or less on one of our facade designs, but on a concrete building here perforating the eastern facade, which you can see here, with those um, holes in it, with the idea of having circular fluorescent lighters behind it. Again, this issue of being um, transformed, asked to do similar things again. And after winning the competition, they contacted us and asked us to join the team and to, to develop the project further. So we, we got interested in the idea of how the inner spaces were organized in, in the building and started to um, use different tessellation patterns to organize all things across the facade. So this is the, the final facade design which is, being, uh, which is going under construction just now. So the first project meeting in Cordoba is next week, so it's kind of exciting because it was a long period. 2006 when the project started into today. And what you can see is, um, together with Nita Superhan, we have transformed the facade to become uh, two things. I think, I think we changed two things which were very important. One thing is uh, the idea of having different scales and obviously getting away more and more from the idea of having this orthogonal grid of pixels. Uh, the whole facade is supposed to serve for the artists who, who are going to work on the inside, so the institution is very similar to the ZKM in Germany, so it's a combination of uh, production and exhibition space. And uh, the issue of scale become became, became important because the building has very strong dimensions. It's 110 meters long, but only 11 meters high, so having very limited budgets, uh, working with ideas, we were working on low resolution and so on, it means you could park only very few pixels in the height of the facade, but a, long, uh, a, a large number on the length of the building, giving very difficult uh, conditions to actually use it as some sort of um, information screen. So the idea came up to do something similar to the retina of the human eye, having a, um, an area of the facade which is higher resolution, uh, which is the focus of your eye when you look straight and you have a blurred vision on the periphery and your brain helps you to put those two images together and uh, you seem to have everything in focus. So what it does, it has a high resolution part in the middle of the facade and then lower resolution things to the sides 
And when you use it uh, for content, basically your brain helps you to understand that the information, which is hardly understandable if you look at, look at it um, isolated, is connected to the um, information in the center. And the second important issue was transforming the facade to be um, three-dimensional again um, and not having the idea of having a perforated facade with uh, lights behind it um, because we need the light in front of the facade and not behind it otherwise it's going to be a pitch black facade with very bright dots in it but they will never connect to each other so we um, transformed that idea of having those shapes to become what we call bowls um, which are lit from the side so the whole thing is uh, made in GRC concrete panels one to 7.5 scale model we did in Perspex and then uh, the very, very early first prototype of the uh, GRC panel being produced in Spain. Unluckily, with a mistake, as you can see, there is holes in there which should be there. And then it becomes, um, it, again, it's, it's a daytime design very heavily, and at nighttime it, it's being transformed. So you can see those different patterns in the facade. Also, giving you a certain link towards the uh, ornamental stuff which is going on in that part of Spain uh, in architecture for a long time, um, but it's just a very brief link. And obviously, changing and giving, giving the facade different depth at different times of the day with the movement of the sun, and then at night time it's being used as this information um, carrier. Um, I'm skipping the animation, I think. You get the idea? Um, I want to talk about language a bit. Um, because somehow I think we are experiencing a renaissance of the image uh, as part of city production without really noticing it or maybe without reflecting it um, enough. The, the, the image in architecture has been important for a long, long, long period. And um, modern architecture kind of freed itself then to move back to become very iconic being a picture in itself. Um, obviously this is about creating a picture because it's about creating medianness. Uh, you want that a building like this is being published and that's why it looks like that. On different levels, advertising happening in cities a lot, so suddenly those images are popping up. Uh, in front of buildings um, uh, while they're being transformed behind it and leading to situations like this which is quite curious um, Leipziger Platz in Berlin uh, what you can see here is a series of photographs taken of uh, one side of Leipziger Platz and um, only two of the buildings you can see are reality this one and this one all the other buildings are just being produced as scaffolding backdrops in order to put fake buildings on it um, to imitate the city which could evolve there over time so the buildings have all been designed but there is no money putting them up there in order to use them for advertising as an advertising back backdrop which I think is a quite um, strange phenomenon and is also um, quite dangerous because it's not producing any sort of urban life same issue with uh, producing uh, architecture based on the idea of an image, like the castle discussion in Berlin, shopping center productions, and uh, obviously um, also things like that, like commercial scenes, uh, screens in the, in the city. So, um, talking about language, what, what, what can a language thing like that be? Um, I want to show a few things, one project called Museum X, a project we did in 2006 in Mönchengladbach for the Museum of Thalberg by Hans Holland, which you probably all know. Um, and this museum had to close down for a period of one year uh, due to renovation. And uh, the director of the museum commissioned us to develop an art installation to represent the museum during the time of closure. Mönchengladbach is a not very well going uh, city. Um, I've been going to school with me, as I mentioned Rapa. And uh, it's somehow, I think I would describe it as a city in depression. You know, it's surrounded <coughs> by other places which are 
uh, having the cultural goods today, which are better for shopping and so on, that has a lot of unemployment. And um, so one phenomenon is, for instance, that cultural things are not going well anymore, the museum wasn't going very well anymore, and um, also this empty theater building at the main shopping road in München Gladbach, a building from the post-war um, area. Um, and uh, it's empty since a couple of years, I think, about eight years now, because the city cannot afford to have a theater anymore. So people go to Düsseldorf or to Cologne instead uh, to watch theater. And uh, the, the city decided to give away that building more or less for free to a company called BCE, which is the biggest shopping center developer in Europe, and um, hoping that their, I think, 18 million or 160 million euro investment producing this huge shopping mall would heal the city center um, of Berlin, uh, of Metin Plata, which obviously, obviously is very doubtful um, because um, the shopping is not going very well and even if the shopping center would be going well, which is ECE very professional in, uh, all the shopping surrounding it probably would die. So the scientist, the director of the museum, suggested that we should be using this building as a backdrop to develop something as a sculpture for the museum and um, um, we were partially happy about that because of how there was in, uh, involved in the, uh, in the movement in, in the society of Milton Gladbach to save the building from being torn down. So our last name was um, a red um, piece of cloth for the politicians. And you wouldn't want to argue with them uh, any kind of project development. Anyhow, what we decided to do is not doing a sculpture for the museum, but rather doing a museum as a sculpture. There was no budget for that project, so all the money for the production of the project had to be raised during the process of designing and realizing it. And we decided to transform that empty theater place to become the image, the Potem Potemkin uh, Museum, the image of the museum. Uh, maybe the image of the museum the Milton Gladbachers would have loved to get when Hans Holland was doing Museum of Thalberg, uh, because at that time it was this quite, in the, in the architectural world it was obviously a very famous building and people were going to, to the city only to see the building, but in the city of Milton Gladbach itself, uh, this was not what the museum should be. So at that time probably they would have liked the image we created. Um, but that's not the reason why we did it. We um, took a photograph of the pebble concrete on the um, Academy of Fine Arts in Berlin and printed it very large uh, on a special text file which is very non-reflective and put it on frames and uh, covered the building uh, with that facade, put a big flag on top, um, cleaned up the plaza in front of the building, put this letter, uh, letters museum um, on the facade and inserted a little foyer, so transforming what was there, uh, making it uh, look uh, similar to a museum foyer. And you could actually go there six days a week for one year as a museum, it was open, but there was no art inside. So it was uh, 65,000 cubic meters of empty building was, was not a single piece of art, but the project produced so much um, movement in the society being realized by private uh, company uh, funds and so on, that finally the politicians, this is the mayor of Menschen <laughs> he honestly opened the building as a new museum for modern art in Menschen A lot of people showed up, we even had our little MoMA lineup of people going inside and looking in nothing. So, why, why did we do that? It's, um, I, I think, in a way, it's also about something you, you could call a media facade. It was the idea of, of um, creating a catalyst for the discussion in the city to think about how to deal with your inner city center. So, to, how to deal with the idea of giving away your cultural goods, not so much about protecting the building which was going to be torn down, but more to uh, create interest. And in a way, uh, I believe this project was um, very similar to the idea Hans Holland had when he developed the um, Museum of Thalberg, because it was one of the first museums in the world which was understood to be a catalyst 
um, in the urban development and vice versa. So the, the urban development also having feedback on the museum itself, uh, which then became the whole idea behind the Bilbao effect, I would say. So, uh, for instance, uh, Frank Geary is always referring to a museum at Talberg to be the reference for Bilbao. Um, and it got very, very successful, surprisingly. Uh, it was located on the main shopping road, and this empty museum had more visitors than the original museum, which is a quite scary thing, I believe, um, in a way. Uh, yeah, so it's maybe it's a one pixel media facade, um, a one image media facade showing one image for a year, but a very strong one. And then you see the contradiction to developments like um, in uh, Berlin, which I have shown at, at Potsdamer Platz which obviously uh, do not create any, any kind of life behind it or life with it um, and this one did very well. Um, continuing a bit on the idea of uh, how, to, how architecture communicates uh, competition, we did together with Bjarke Ingels from Wig in Copenhagen and um, also last year was a competition for an art zug, uh, so a temporary art uh, Pavilion to be erected in Abu Dhabi as a forerunner for the whole huge museum development um, which is going to happen there with Zad and so on uh, and um, uh, containing art mostly and it was an invited competition with Shigeru uh, Ban and Bjarke Ingels and so Bjarke Ingels got us on board in order to work on the uh, communicative side of that building and just very briefly we worked on two things it's more about uh, the language thing I want to show here. Um, creating a changeable facade, but a very uh, simple changeable facade, which is not communicating via images, but is communicating by the idea of color, or more, more precisely by material. So it's um, featuring a very scaled up tri vision system, which you know from the advertising industry, and so. Um, the building can change appearance. Um, show a little animation of that. Oh, loose. So the idea behind it is not to um, have a carrier for information, but rather to to bring the whole thing back and have architecture itself communicate, communicate by, it all, by its own means, by the material quality, by the re reflective qualities of the material, by color and so on. So it's a um, very abstract thing, but very large scale, very powerful. The second thing, uh, I don't need to go into detail on that one, this was rather on the long distance side, is the development of two clouds, which you can see, which are hovering above the building. Um, and which were reflecting Bjarke's design for the building to become um, a signage for the building, a long range a visible thing. Uh, so the whole idea of the building is to cast shadow on the roof and we elevated that to the top in order to cast shadow to the entrance courtyards of the building, then being moved with the sun and casting shadow for the entrances. What's the time, please? I don't know. I don't know. Um, just a few things, maybe. Um, this is another project we have also done with uh, Buha in Singapore. It's also nearly completed. Um, it was a very difficult brief. It was a brief on a building having a commercial high res screen uh, for a generation of money, and we were supposed to develop something surrounding it. And um, what we did, we opened up the facade of this building and uh, did develop something surrounding the screen. In the beginning, we, we did not really have the drive to, to support commercial images being glued to architecture because it rather neglects architecture. But then thought maybe we had a possibility to rather develop something which would, would work as a a translating element between this foreign element of architecture which is neglecting it, attracting as much attention as possible and 
pushing the architecture itself to the background, developing something which would allow you to actually push back the commercial stream and uh, work as a joint in between the two, uh, so the two get, get along a bit better. So we surrounded this high-res screen with a field of 544, I believe, LED units. It's the first color installation we have um, done, which are installed in a double-layer facade. So you have a glass facade in the front. You can see the linear LED elements there, and they're projecting towards the rear wall of the building, and the rear wall features windows for the offices behind it. And the offices have um, roller blinds, uh, in front of those windows, which are um, motion sensor controlled, so if an office in the building is being used, uh, the motion detector detects that, the roller blind is up so that people can look out and uh, the light in front is being uh, turned off because those LED units project to the rear. And the whole thing works as um, is something which does not try to compete or anything, but it just, just takes what is there. It takes the um, biggest signal of the high-res screen and uses a quite complex piece of software analyzing that um, incoming video signal in real time and transforming it to become in every unique um, transition of the image. So you kind of see how it looks in the projected manner. And if people are working, obviously the windows will be open and you start to have this layering process of having not only the information on the outside but also the information from the inside against the two things merge. Just a few moving images of that in order to get a sense how it looks. I will talk a bit more about the software in this context. Um, it's very rough video material, I'm sorry for that. It's um, just taken with a handy cam. Um, uh, the, the software does uh, three different modes. We, we call them modes. So the regular operational mode of this is, um, is that it's analyzing this incoming video signal and uses a, a series of algorithms and analysis. First, there is image analysis, so for instance, it can do face uh, recognition. So if it recognizes big faces, it will use um, uh, effects which are suitable to be used on big faces, for instance. Um, and then uses algorithms in different combinations, and the combinations are always um, unique. I think altogether there's about 8,000 possibilities, and then with the um, changing content coming from the high res screen is um, always looking completely different. That's a regular mode while commercial commercials are being uh, shown. Then there is what we call recursive mode, what you can see here, when the uh, low res resolution screen surrounding the high res one or here feeds back onto the high res one. So the people doing advertising on the facade get offered extra free time if they allow our software to alter their signal and then we have what we call dream mode which is uh, basically uh, a substitute for what is happening on every commercial screen in the world which is the use of filler content they um, call it pretty pictures usually showing national geographic and things like that uh, there is no pretty pictures here uh, but the machine memorizes everything it has seen in the past and uses all this video information which is being put in a database which is growing and growing and growing and um, puts it to, together to a complete abstract piece of um, video art. So it's always contextualized around this idea of what is happening there. Here you see the roller blinds going down um, when the office is being empty. Uh, this is all kind of uh, test shots really because the building is not really in use, any, uh, use yet and also the software has not been fully um, adjusted so we're waiting for this to, to happen quite soon. Um, let me show two more things, coming back to the idea of um, doing architecture by all means which I started off with. Um, 
one direction we are very interested in uh, over the last three years. It was what we call the use of any te anyhow technology. So technology used in architectural production, but which you do not understand necessarily to, to be part of your aesthetic um, potential in a project. So, for instance, um, this installation which we did for Artist Space in New York is a, an installation with two seven-segment displays, which um, are uh, fluorescent uh, lamps and which are pragmatic um, lighting in that space. And at the same time, they show the time, the minute of the hour. So suddenly, you do the turn back that. Um, Always difficult to click and talk at the same time. It's, um, it's doing back the loop of using light as in the Kunsthaus Graz to become information carrier or to use them as light source um, again. So it's a very playful thing. Um, actually, we developed that for a bus terminal station in Switzerland, but it wasn't realized. Um, combining those two different um, issues. You get the idea. And then um, a similar thing, uh, turning that piece um, or, or uh, putting it um, forward a bit more was on a commission for the European Central Bank by Corp uh, in uh, Frankfurt, where we um, got a hidden commission somehow to develop the night appearance of that building with light. Uh, but being commissioned as lighting designers because there was no uh, budget from the bank side to commission anyone that would think about the appearance of the building. And we got interested in um, looking at the idea of using what is uh, there anyhow in this building. It, uh, actually, the, the, the project itself is called Nix for Nothing because you don't need to add anything. Um, um, it's, it's based on the idea of using every single light element in the high rise structure. So, that was before the European Central Bank was a fake building, so we just designed for the purpose of visualizing it. Today, that would be quite fashionable, I guess. Um, and um, making those buildings which are fully glazed becoming lighting volumes which are alterable. So, uh, if you look at that, the look somehow. Like that. Uh, that's a very abstract thing we did uh, before being commissioned for the European Central Bank. But giving you the understanding of that if the people have gone home at night time and the building automation system understands nobody nobody's there anymore, the control is handed over to the um, artistic machine, machinery behind it and making every floor in the building become um, lighting grid which is controllable dynamically and then obviously when you step, uh, stack them on top of each other um, you get this lighting volume and then this advanced um, software development uh, which was necessary to, to, to visualize anything like that we developed that further for um, the bank it's a music video, I'll show you the music. So the idea behind it was to... I think um, the, the, the motivation of Kurt Himmelblau getting us into the project, the project manager, manager said um, at the time, we are afraid a bit of the big euro sign on top of the building, so we need something to replace the big euro sign. And um, for us, it was this perfect image of integrating an idea like that into a building for the European Central Bank because the message the European Central Bank tries to communicate is that they are like the perfect body of coordination. That through their coordination, we have this um, unified currency in Europe and they pull the, the, the strings. And so they communicate to the outside in an abstract manner. It's perfect, it's perfect coordination. And at the same time, everybody who keeps on working this voice image because the officers can participate. So it becomes this very ironic 
um, not at the same time as I actually like most um, about this idea. Yeah, so, but it's not happening. Sorry. Um, auto state is happening, but in a very reduced version, so not dynamic. And um, so currently we are uh, still searching the right high rise to, to put this into. The, the technology is there, we have developed it quite far. Uh, even like the the, the method, methodology behind visualizing something like this is much more difficult than we believe in the beginning because of three dimensional, and obviously, in this case, for instance, it's 22,000 um, uh, light elements, and you can wait them for them to be uh, rendered. And so, part of our job, for instance, today is to travel throughout the world and talk to people who do high rises and identify are they office groups. Are they fully glazed and filter out the ones that you could use the idea for? But so far, um, not successful. Enough for that, I guess. Thanks.